Welcome to episode nine of Mick Gold Riffs. And uh, continuing on with playing with the very best guitar players in the city of Boston. I have probably the best guitar player in the city of Boston right here with me. And uh, Scott, and, and again, the correct pronunciation of your last name. Truly. Yeah. I got it. And I'm only half Italian, you know. <laughs> So, um, uh, uh, again, I hope you folks have been practicing. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, he will be ch testing you because we have, uh, he's a Berkeley professor. So, you know, uh, I started this about uh, a couple of months ago and we did the first six or seven with a straight ahead lesson, C, F, G, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And the last three now I've been interviewing a bunch of different guys. So let's talk a little bit about Scott's background here. Uh, after spending time as a Boston uh, local sideman and turning, uh, touring artist, uh, Scott performs live and records with players like uh, a whole bunch of people here and the people I know Mark Egan oh yeah bass player with uh, Pat Metheny exactly yeah unbelievable Nile Rogers pretty famous guy right? I was on a record with him I know I know yeah, 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 we'll, yeah. we'll talk about that but uh, <laughs> Steve Guy he He's pretty good bass drummer, right? He's, yeah. he's all right. Yeah, he, he knows mean, he, what he's he, doing. He, he, did, he did well. And Abe Laboreal, senior or junior? Senior. Senior was teaching at Berkeley when I was there in the 70s. He was a bass teacher. He Him was? and Steve Swallow. Yeah. They were like the two best guys. Now, Abe Laboreal Jr. is the drummer with uh, Paul McCartney right now. And everybody. So I want to hear a little bit about that. The Temptations? I did a run with The Temptations, yeah. Wow. Yeah, cool, yeah. Cool, cool. I was that, happy. You know, it was a little bit of a... We yeah. I got sunshine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was in the set. Okay, and uh, a few I didn't don't know, but uh, Scott is currently a professor of guitar at the renowned Berklee College of Music in Boston, my alma mater from uh, the last century, um, <laughs> where you teach private students there in professional guitar labs. Yeah. Um, you're touring all over the place. You've toured, uh, you know, all over Europe, et cetera, and you've got three albums to your name out there right now. There, yeah. Yep. And uh, under your name, uh, with your trio and or quartet, right? Yeah, I mean, there's um, the first one was quartet. The last one had a lot of different instruments. Right, right. Was, that was 2012. Yeah, and I, I love this stuff, man. And he's been playing uh, probably, your, I'd like to talk a little bit about the studio, too, and how you sought after that. And I'd like to talk a little bit of how it works today. Because I don't think anyone goes in the studio anymore. They do it at home. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. But um, again, let's start at the very beginning. I always like to know, and I'm always fascinated by the commonalities amongst uh, guitar players and uh, and how we grow up and how we start and that sort of thing. So you're from Ohio, you just told me. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. When you know, And when was the first time guitar said, man, I want to do that? Uh, well, um, in... I guess in my uh, childhood when I was in Ohio, we moved here, my family moved here when I was 10. Uh -huh. And I was listening to like George Harrison 45s. My mom used to bring me home a 45 a week. So you really, your maturation was in Massachusetts? Yes. Yeah, okay. So when I got here, uh, my uncle was a working drummer uh -huh. and I used to hang out with him. Um, the real eureka moment, there was two of them, um, was at the time, I think I was 11, uh, Ario Speedwagon had this album called High Infidelity that just mm -hmm. came out. And so it was a big album, every song was a hit, and we were renting videos at Leechmere. That's how yeah, <laughs> I remember yeah. Leechmere. And you know, my mom said, pick something. I said, oh, I've heard of those guys. And where'd you live? What town? Uh, Sherburn. Oh, you were at the Metro West area. Exactly, okay, cool. yeah. And we took it home and um, this guitar player had this gorgeous guitar. It was I found out later it's a '58 Les Paul, I think given to him by Joe Walsh. Uh huh. And it just plugged right into a Marshall, and he looked so cool. And he was like, every time he hit a chord, it just shook my body. And um, so I used, to, you know, I actually had to like mow a lot of lawns and wash a lot of neighbors' cars to afford. Like the VHS was 28 bucks to right, own it. Right, right, right. That, that was that expensive. Was, that was a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. I was obsessed with that, so, and then I was into Blue Oyster Cult, uh, big time. And right, right, I remember that from the, um, he did a, um, a podcast, I'm a big podcast uh, fan these days, and there's uh, a great one by uh, Jude, Jude Gold. Gold, and it's called No Guitar Is Safe. Yeah. No Guitar Is Safe, and, and you talked a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, so it's, um, there was a, a, a solo on the live album, because they had the song Burning For You, remember that? Right, right. And, I'm uh, burning, I'm burning. Yeah. I'm burning. That's probably. Something like it's, that. It's, it's, I think it's. 
It's got the right and then right and then right goes to C. Uh, anyways, yeah. So I got the live album, and you were what, twelve now, like tenish? I was ten, eleven. Right. And there was this song uh, from the latest album called um, "Veteran of the Psychic Wars," where uh -huh. Buck Dharma plays this insane solo, probably one of the greatest rock solos I think ever recorded, and it was live. I talked to Buck later on, um, and he said it was just improvised every night. But I remember not playing guitar, but like moving the needle back, going, "This is so haunting." Yeah, you go this back is so to the needle. I didn't think you go back to the needle. Oh, vinyl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so. Um, I begged my parents to play drums. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know why. I think because my, my uncle was a drummer. Right, right. And um, they said, no, that's going to be too loud. But then, like, after seeing Gary and his 58 Les Paul, right. I wanted one of those. Right, right. But ha little did I know those were a little out of the price range. Right, right. <laughs> so that was the big thing. And then I started actually taking lessons at Center Music in Framingham. Center Music. Center oh, yeah, Music absolutely. House. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, with Corbett the, uh, still episode there. seven, uh, one of the teachers from there is John Paoli. I don't know if you know John. He graduated probably about 10 years ago. Were you there? How long have you been at Berkeley? 20 years. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. yeah. So he's a uh, man. I love Corb and Arthur Owens was my teacher. I started at 12. Right. And um, I owe them a lot because they were super supportive. They had these gigs for us to play as kids. Uh -huh. They kept us out of trouble. How'd you start? Uh, how did it go? Was it CFG, first position, then get into some reading, or did you go legit that way, or was it all riffs, or what was it? Well, um, actually, the first part is they tried to make me play right-handed. Well, that, that's, if you haven't noticed, folks at home, <laughs> um, he's playing totally incorrectly here. He's playing <laughs> the backwards way, you know? So, um, and I think I've heard you talk about that, and that didn't work, right? Yeah, and I would go home and practice, but like even now, if you get, I don't think I could learn right-handed. Like a lot of people say, I'm left-handed, but I play right-handed. But I'm one of the cases where it just didn't work. The pick would fall out and I would show up. And um, I don't think we'd have this kind of honesty these days, but mm -hmm. they were just kind of like, we don't know if guitar is for your son. Right. And I begged them to like put the strings and thank you, Corb. Corb's like, absolutely. He puts the, and then I started making progress, but it was. Was it an upside down kind of strat where? Uh, it was an acoustic, Because this is a guitar that's built for left-handed right now, which yeah. is very different. Um, right. And back, uh, if you remember uh, Hendrix, of course, and I, and I have read that you, you weren't, uh, Hendrix wasn't a big influence, but Hendrix played upside down where the E, the low E, the high E was here. No, right? the low E was here. That's, uh -huh. he, he restrung a right. Oh, he did. I wondered how he yeah. did that. Yeah. Although I'm a, he, he, Hendrix is a huge influence. He came later. Okay, okay. So like when yeah. I f first heard Band of Gypsies when I was eight, uh, 20. Yeah. That was it. That was it. And then I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Hendrix fanatic now. But I didn't start out that way, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and then all the, you know, like the... Uh... Yeah. All that stuff was like, I mean, there was, he was a freak. I mean, it yeah. was sonic. Yeah. Nobody can really do Hendrix ever because it's a sonic You know, thing. last week was uh, the Woodstock thing, and, and I right. got to re-see um, him. Uh, there's a good Netflix uh, thing out right now. And just uh, what he was doing on the Star Spangled Brand, I, I uh, admired it, appreciated it much more, because knowing, you know, he didn't have like, I mean, this thing here is a Paul Reed Smith with all kinds of cool things that not let the guitar go out of the tune. <laughs> and what he was doing, man, it's like, was unbelievable. And I've heard guitarists I respect say, you know, oh, I can't stand him. I'm an intonation guy. He was he was out of tune. That guy's pitch was perfect. Like the bends, the his control of feedback, and like listen to Machine Gun. I mean, I, I loved him. I loved him. But kind of, kind of like Van Halen. I want to get on that road too. Um, I didn't get Van Halen. And I did not get <laughs> Hendrix. I just didn't. I, you know, Ever? I thought, uh, no. And it's like I can't do that. And I'm gonna I'm not gonna even try. <laughs> Actually, I've had students like that too. You get a roadblock, and I don't know if you do that. So, thing, it's like you get a roadblock playing guitar. Go around it and try something else. 
you know, and uh, don't, if that's not your thing, and, and Van Halen, you're of that age. But let me continue on, man. Yeah, yeah. So you're like 12, you're in about 15 or so, and playing in Framingham, which is close to where you were yeah. growing up. And so did you play in high school bands? Did you play in a high school orchestra type stuff and mm -hmm. legit stuff um, in like Sherborne High? That uh, Dover Sherborne. Okay, cool. Um, did you do that? And were you in like the local rock band doing... Van Halen stuff when yeah. you were 16, 17. I had a band of friends that we rehearsed like twice a week. Mm -hmm. Even before we could drive, our parents would drive us. Um, I was in jazz band with Bob Martell, who was, uh, I owe him a lot. He was the he was the new band teacher when I was a fresh, well, I'm sorry, my senior year, it was his first year. Uh -huh. And he used to sit with me during lunch break and help me. Was help he like reading. right out of college type thing, a young guy? Uh, he was, yeah, he was a younger, uh, um, but, um, he would sit down and help me with my reading. And was then, he a guitar player? Uh, he was a classical guitar player. Uh huh. Um, but he knew the chords, and then he actually gave me this opportunity. We did Pat Metheny's If I Could. He arranged it for orchestra. And then it was just me in the middle. So actually, I just, I mean, it's not a virtuosic piece, it's a beautiful piece. And um, I remember, like, you know, he, had, he did this whole thing, but he worked so hard with me. But so I, was, I was doing the stuff where I was, really working on my reading, my chord voicings, but then I was in the rock bands doing anything on the radio. Right. Um, all through high school and any opportunity. I mean, I was, we would play anything. We've played, like we forced ourselves onto some of the parents' parties. <laughs> like, so you weren't in numerous bands. You were with one in particular from um, most of high school. One in particular, but you know, there was people I jammed with a lot. Right, right. You know, um, but there was one that we would always like try to get new tunes and um, yeah, there, I think there's a video of us with me, like when I was 16 or 17 at Dover Sherburne, like they videotaped it. Mm -hmm. cool. I got to to find a copy of that because I, I want to upload that. Cause I remember it being right. cool. Like, right, right. I, I wasn't singing, but the drummer and the, the lead singer were harmonizing nice on like outfield tunes and oh, really? Journey. Cool. Cool. So, um, I don't know. Maybe I'll feel different if I look at it. I remember it being good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or fun. Cool. Maybe, maybe fun's the right word. So you did the high school thing and then college decision comes up. And if you're local here, I mean, and you're a guitar player, Berkeley had to be in your mindset. You know, it's... Because you didn't. He told me earlier that he didn't go to Berkeley. That's a great question because it wasn't in my mindset at all because I, the only time I went to Berkeley was when I was 16. I did the five-week program. It's like a summer program. Oh, really? Yeah, cool. And yeah. It, so it's a summer program and I loved it. But when it came time, I just I had no self-esteem. I had fun playing guitar, but I was too afraid to even apply. So I didn't even That's apply. That's amazing, man, because you are a monster. Oh, man. I don't. And I'm sure you were great then. You, know, and you were getting instruction and then instruction I was. from high school. So you, you were probably, were you reading? I was reading okay. I mean, right. I mean, I wasn't, I got a lot better later on, but I, My you know. My experience are guys who are really, really good at reading. Most, <laughs> not that great players, but they're great at reading, except for like Larry Carlton and Tommy Tedesco and guys like that who can read anything. Oh, well, forget um, it. There are guys like that, but. Um, I could never read. You know, Jeff like Beck um, doesn't read. I guarantee you. I gar I, I'm not just sure, but I doubt it. Well, and, and Eric Clapton, read. I guarantee you. Well, they don't have to read. Right, right. They never right, had to. That right. wasn't a tool they needed. And I don't know, this, this day and age, it's kind of like, I could see the guys when I was coming up, right. the older generation was always saying, if you don't know how to read anything, you'll never work. And I can right, right. understand that in the 70s. There's, yeah, there's some, it depends. You know, I, I, I want to get into who your influences and, yeah. you know, um, you know that that sort of thing, but I've all and what what you consider yourself. I, I, I listen to you. I see a jazz fusion guy is what I hear. Um, I consider myself a um, Swiss Army knife. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever is needed, I can I can fake Van Halen mm -hmm. and I can fake classical. You know, and mm -hmm. I, anything in between, anything mm -hmm. in between. What do you consider yourself? Um, Anything. I mean, I do a lot of singer songwriter sideman stuff. So when I do session work, right, it's the texture guitar for the song. Um, it's getting that sound. Um, I love pop music. I love rock. Um, but I, I don't know what I consider myself. I mean, my influences musically is everything. I mean, I love Bartok, Debussy. I study the scores and 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 the albums just for a sonic and composition perspective. Mm -hmm. But then like Herbie Hancock. Keith Jarrett, uh, late John Coltrane, um, as far as phrasing goes, I don't know. Right. Um, but I do play jazz standards and I can play jazz. Um, I worked on that a lot in my 20s. Like for a while, I just wanted to play jazz. I like left rock for a few I years. I did the same thing, man, at Berkeley. It's like, yeah. you know, and got, got rid of all my Who albums and, and Stone albums. It's and I'm there, no, I'm a jazzer now. And I missed 
all those mid set like Bruce Springsteen, all those bands did that. I just I mean, I don't listen to that stuff. I was listening to Joe Pass. I met Joe Pass once. You um, did? Yeah, at the Jazz Workshop. It's something you probably oh, never I, heard of. I know, have heard of it, Boyle of course. Street. It was an amazing club. Bill Evans and, used to play there a lot. There's a right, lot of it was them. the best of the best in the world. So I got there for an 8 o'clock show at 6. Yeah. With my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And in comes Joe Pass. Short, squat, kind of bigger guy. Big cigar like this. <laughs> comes in. And he comes in and he looks at me and goes, Berkeley? And I go, yeah. And he just, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> I hear so many great stories so, about so Joe he's just, uh, he, he, He's an interesting guy. So you, you got into that decision. So Berkeley was not on the mindset. But I bet, just because the way I, you, you, know, you, you handle yourself, I bet you you defined yourself as a guitar player. At, at the 18, time? 19. You know, I did. Right. Yeah, that's, um, I did, and that's what was so important to me. When I... When I came home, I, I, I didn't really go to parties. I didn't really, I wasn't that social even in high school. I came home and I would like memorize entire albums. Like there's one Iron Maiden album, the live one where you can, there's two guitarists and they're panned hard left and right. And you can shut one of them off. Remember like on the tape decks, you can shut off like right, left or right, 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 or pan it. Right. And so I used to shut off one and play the whole show and try to play the parts of all the harmony parts, all the rhythm parts. And I would just do that. My mom would try to get me up for dinner by six and sometimes I would come up at nine, the kitchen would be clean, the lights would be off, but like my food would be cold on the... <laughs> so it's a, it's a typical thing with guitar players. I was about 10, 11, 12 years old. I started at 10 with a fourth grader with a nun there uh, where I grew up in the city. And um, on Saturdays, it was eight in the morning and uh, I would eat lunch, yeah, I would come out for that. Yeah. And I would come out at five for dinner and eight at night I'd probably put it away. But that's what you find. It becomes an obsession with people. So we're at UMass. You go to UMass, Dartmouth. Did yeah. you do music there? Were you biology? Were you engineering? What were you doing at UMass, Dartmouth? And were you playing with bands? Um, yeah. So when well, I is there a music scene there? Actually, yeah, in the New Bedford, Providence area, absolutely. Right, New Bedford, definitely a lot of music in Providence. So this is a great segue to my next thing. Well, first of all, I got accepted in the music program. My grades were, uh -huh. eh, Yeah, well, UMass has, all the UMass, uh, Lowell, uh, UMass Amherst, they all have music programs. Really good ones. Good ones. Yeah. Really and great ones. I played ones. with a lot of folks from UMass Lowell. I think that's a heavy duty it program is. up there. It's a great program. Yeah. Yeah, those, they're not messing around. Um, but, um, I was going to get my guidance counselor, again, this is funny about the times, my guidance counselor at the time when I was in high school said, don't bother, like you should go to a trade school, like don't finish your senior year, go to a trade school and start working on cars because oh. my grades weren't great. Um, don't you love that? And so, <laughs> this so, guy is seriously, you've got to go on to, and we will talk about how to get a hold of you, and I'm just trying to see what time we have here. Okay, yeah, so we got, we got, we got good time. So. Um, you got one of the best guitar players I've ever heard, you know, and, and that's, you know, someone saying that to you, just, I mean, well, how upsetting is that? It was so upsetting, but the, there's a good end to the story. So I, I applied to a bunch of schools and he said, you know, you'll luck, be lucky to get into Dean because that's a really good. I know Dean, yeah. It's Dean's a, right down the street from here, yeah. It's exactly. He goes, it's a really good school. You'd be lucky to get into that. And I'm like, I'll apply there. That sounds good. They, yeah. um, Kasher used to teach there. I uh, um, don't know. Uh, My wife worked there for years, but uh, it has a great dance program. That's what it's famous yeah. for. Yeah. So anyways, I went and auditioned at UMass Dartmouth, and my guidance counselor had to pull me out of science class two weeks later and say, okay, we, I just got a call from uh, UMass Dartmouth, and they've accepted you. Cool. And I, but like he was the one who told me not to bother. Right, right. So he had to tell me. So I went, I started the music program. It was a great compositional program. I was studying more composition, 20th century composition. Um, Bill Bonacore was a guitar teacher who was, was one of the greatest classical players. So your undergraduate degree you were going for it was music and that's what you got? Well, I, I ended up switching to um, multi, what's called multidisciplinary. So I studied English writing communications, okay, cool. rhetoric. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and then, so it's half a music Not to interrupt you because I've, I've read a lot about you. you. You do some philosophy as well. That's yes. A, that's a uh, thing that you follow. The last three years. And you know, reading a lot of the philosophers is one thing, but understanding is another. So I studied with this guy, Greg Sadler, on Skype, Dr. Greg Sadler. He's the coolest guy. Cool. And we went through Aristotle's rhetoric. We're going through Cicero's uh, Moral Ends right now. And uh, he's had me go through some, some Nietzsche. But if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't understand any of this stuff. It's hmm. not, you don't just read it. It's like every line. So he gives me prompts, but like it's really helped me in my music. It's kind of a good point to bring up that mm -hmm. you start really organizing your thoughts definitions of stuff, um, 
things about morality or vices and virtues and you start to go, huh, am, am I making the best decision doing this? So for me, it's kind of my therapy is, and it's cool. the classics. It's, cool. you know, well, even the existentials like Sartre and um, Camus and all them, stuff that's newer, like, you know, in the 60s or whatever, but um, it's, I recommend it. I mean, but cool. I, I don't recommend just reading and think you understand it because it's like one of those things that I always joke with Greg. I, I'm like, so I got Greg this. Sadler, you can look Gr up that way. Greg, yeah, Greg Sadler. Okay, cool. Um, he's the best, and I recommend sending him an email saying uh, if you want to study. I started studying rhetoric because I mm. think it's important for all musicians to understand BS. Like, mm -hmm. you know, as you get older, we learn. Right, right. But then you start to, you know, Aristotle's rhetoric is all about persuasion and how to protect yourself against things that don't make sense. You know, uh, again, going back to that podcast, I, which I re-listened to recently, uh, you talk a little bit about some of your lessons, actually, you don't even pick up a guitar with some of your students. Yeah. You know, so you're talking about maybe how to approach things or... or yeah, I, I mean, I have this thing that for me I found that you can't practice through certain things. Like I used to say, I can't get this passage, I can't get this passage, and my, my hands would right, start right. hurting, um, and then it would just don't go the method is to go around it and skip it and don't go back. But, <laughs> but he actually does it. So, but um, it's it's actually a, to cut me out of it. A good story is in high school there was a drummer in the jazz band. He couldn't keep time. And one time we had a substitute teacher come in and she was laughing at him, which broke my heart because he was God. a friend of mine. God, it's back in our day, right? right, right. <laughs> back back in the before. So, and um, he just couldn't get it together. I know all he did was practice. I, we graduated two years later. I was in a pit orchestra playing West Side Story, and I'm uh -huh. like, "Oh God, this guy's in it." And West Side Story's got so Where? many meter changes. Where were you doing that? This was like for a high school type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was on West Side Story is about the hardest music you can read. Oh, it's hard. Oh, that's real hard. And he and he was on fire. Cool. I mean, he killed it. And this was only two years later. And I'm like, and I'm thinking like, "Wow, man, you must you've been practicing. You sound amazing." He goes, "No, actually, I, I didn't play for a while. I just, you know." I think he went mm -hmm. to therapy or something. So that was the first indication of, well, there's some things that are mental blocks. There's some right, things right. that are in your way up here. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the way you think of a phrase. Um, so I try to break it down. But sometimes, you know, I, have, I, I had a student that was amazing potential, put too much pressure on himself. So I don't know, I've developed all these exercises. And if anybody ever studies with me and feels like I can help them, let me know, but um, I have all these exercises that we kind of do. So we don't just like talk or meditate. Mm -hmm. We actually go through a bunch of stuff so they can get self-aware to see where this thing is they need to remove. Um, and then you can really practice. But it's it's kind of like trying to run through a brick wall. You feel like if I, if I keep doing it, the brick wall is going to fall over. Right, right. You know? Sometimes willpower is not the well, only thing. And, you, and that sounds weird because everybody that told me, it's like, well, you don't, you're not practicing hard enough. Well, I'm practicing 10 hours a day. No, nope, that's not enough. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you sound awful, you know? And I'm, uh, wow, but like it wasn't the practicing part. It was I wasn't practicing correctly or my mindset that's wasn't correct. That's the point, correct. you know, I, I have another life. I'm, I'm, I've been a pilot for 30 years and, and I, flew, oh, really? I flew competitive aerobatics for years. You did? But, uh, oh. because, and that's very, very expensive as you can imagine. <laughs> but uh, I got really perfect and good at flying incorrectly because I didn't want to spend the other hundred bucks an hour to have a coach on the ground because when you're doing aerobatics you gotta but it's just like playing guitar it's like you can get really good and practice over and over incorrectly incorrectly or like but you know, getting a little bit of that coaching and teaching instruction and you know it, it, the sign of a good teacher isn't is kind of like them understanding how you work in other words I don't think it's a good idea for somebody to have a stack of handouts and everybody that comes in, they get the same thing. Right. Okay, yeah, just do it this way. Yeah, start from here, go to here. Because there's, no, um, there's no perspective for the student. Everybody thinks differently. Their minds work differently. They have different emotional kind of blocks or whatever. Um, so, you know, I think the best part of teaching is kind of like being able to read people mm -hmm. and understand them and like, you know, kind of seeing what they respond to, what they're hearing, what they, well, of course, what they need help in. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's a whole thing. It's, it's, we could go on for hours. So you graduated that. UMass. Oh, what happened then? Well, at UMass, I joined a band right when I got there called This Side of Seven. It was an original rock band, um, older, older people at the time. I mean, by that, I mean late 20s, 30s. Right. Um, and you were like 20, 21. I was 18, actually. Oh, really? They, yeah, it was right when I got to school. And um, I auditioned, and they were like, I would say it's like early U2 mixed with the cult. Uh-huh. It yeah, was yeah. great. I was in heaven, and they were had gigs everywhere. I mean, we were just gig gigging all the time. We rehearsed twice a week, 
I do reunion shows with them because they're good friends still. Uh, actually, I just saw a bunch of them a few weeks ago at a gig I did in New Bedford. So, um, so that kind of fizzled out, um, and then I graduated, and I went. I pretty much went right on the road. Let me stop you there. Where was you playing there? Were you playing some of the stuff you're playing these days? Were you playing pentatonic? Did you know oh. major scales? Did you understand theory and all that stuff? Were you there? <sighs> um, I learned a lot from playing in that band because I was coming out of the '80s, kind of like legato. Um, speed picking stuff, right? Um, and this band was more conducive to like the edge or dreamy right, sounds, right. or sounds or textures, not just playing the chords. So my playing, when if you listen to me, like the first year in that band is like rolling around the fretboard, mm -hmm. like you know, really being like an eighteen-year-old hyped up, like on on mm -hmm. edge. You can hear, right, right. but then um, the later stuff I like when we started writing stuff together. Um, where I'm starting to play more texture stuff that goes against it, and um, you know I, that's a place to do it. So uh, theory-wise, yeah, sure. I, I guess I knew a lot of theory, but I kind of did my stuff. You know, I would, the early people when I was like practicing all the time were like Randy Rhodes, um, you know, like the White Snake. Is, let's talk influences. Uh, we're, you're an '80s guy, right? That's where was, I came was up. Was it Van Halen, the man, the guy? Um, it seems like a lot of guys your age. You know, or in the late 30s or whatever, it's like Van Halen was like it. And I, and again, like I said, I missed it. <laughs> I just, I'm there, what is he doing? Well, I don't know and I don't want to know. Well, here's the thing about Eddie. It's like, I mean, he was amazing, but nobody can do Eddie. I mean, you can cop right. the tapping, but you can't cop his feel. Right, right. I mean, I never heard anybody do the Beat It solo well. I mean, they played right, the no right. right notes, but there's something slippery about his time feel. And knowing that, man, I bet you he whipped that right off. I don't uh, yeah. know. I haven't read anything about it, but I. It just sounds like he was just, you know. I heard yeah. a great line from Eddie Van Halen. It says, "My soloing is like being on a tightrope. <laughs> I could fall at any moment." And that's that's a great way to play because screw, try it, man. Go on that edge. Be, yeah, you can just re-record it, you know. But it right. just sounds like a first take thing to me. I don't know. Well, yeah. When you listen to the isolated tracks of Van Halen records, it's kind of like his rhythm playing and his lead playing are one to me. Right. Because his time was so good. There wasn't a better rock rhythm guitar player than Eddie Van Halen to me. And that's the stuff that we all Keith forgot. Keith Richards? Oh, well, that's a different thing. <laughs> that's different no, thing. You know, Keith yeah. Richards is so one let's of go. my idols. So yeah. you went on the road immediately with, what, The Temptations? Or what did you oh, do? Oh, no, no, no. It was, um, you know, everybody says, well, how do I, how do I um, start working? Do I need a, you know, remember when we had press kits, but now it's web right, websites. Right, right. Do I need a business card? Do I need this? I said, well, that's all not going to hurt you. But just say yes. And so I said yes. Somebody heard me in a practice room and said, hey, I have a gig. Like, do you want to play? Yeah. So I show up and play. And then I think the drummer said, I'm going on tour with this singer mm -hmm. for, for 10 days. And it was like one of those, you know, you're in the back of a van. Right, you know? right, right. And, uh, I tour think is a, um, <laughs> a euphemism that we often use. <laughs> It's not as glamorous. Uh, my first, like I told you, I graduated from Berkeley, went on the road almost immediately, and uh, four rooms, four guys in a Holiday Inn room together. That's it. <laughs> it was. Um, I'm there. So this is it. Hi, huh? I went to four years of Berkeley for this. <laughs> and yeah, and so I would do that, and then I started. Do you remember like the Marriott circuit? Sure. So like you, you would get in a top forty band, and you would be you stay at different Marriotts in different cities. I did that it, in the, in seventy eight, seventy nine, and eighty. And that yeah. ended like I caught the tail end of that, and then. I just started saying yes because singers would be like, I need a guitar player for my demo. Right. And um, so I started saying yes to all that stuff. And cool. that's where I got a lot of the experience is I just, um, I was lucky because when I got out of college, there was a ton of work. Right. So I was playing like 10 gigs a week. Remember like there's happy hour? Remember sure. we used to have that? Yeah, so yeah. five to seven, you'd do your happy hour gig and then nine to one would be your other one. So you could right. do like 10 gigs a week. Right, right. Um, and um, Were you living in Boston then? I was, I was living in New Bedford at the time, but then I moved, um, I moved around a lot, but I started working more in Boston probably by the time I was 28. Mm -hmm. And so I started playing. Um, so you got a rep as being a go-to guy? Um, in some circles, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, in some circles, yeah. uh, I started playing with different, actually fusion bands, like, um, you know, players that were way above my level at the time. Uh, but I would play like, you know, Riles. Right, you um, were doing that Skellers, jazz yeah. yeah, it was kind of like rock, rock, jazz, rock jazz. and then, um, and then you know, singer songwriter stuff was a lot of times my favorite, especially if there were good songwriters. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing like yeah. playing a great song every night, right? And playing the texture. And I keep telling a lot of students, it's like great to be able to solo, but you know, I've been on tours where I don't solo once. 
The only solo I play is in my hotel room. Right, <laughs> and I've told that to many young guitar players, and I've heard you say the same thing, is my rhythm has made me more money than anything. You and, will put and, food on the table. And again, I, I, you know, it's like, I, uh, you know, like I told you, I spent many years in, in high tech, but I was always playing guitar on the weekends and stuff, but I just got back to teaching. You know, and it's it's interesting when because I, I was always, a, you know, a, a good. You know that kind of thing, and I don't know how to teach that man. And it's like uh, since I've been out of the teaching thing, there seems to be this a lot of up and down sort of. Was that up down? That was up and down fifteen <laughs> times, down once, and it's like. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know how to teach that. Yeah. Well, you know, you can't really teach feel. You can't. Right, you can't teach. I don't feel. think you can. Yeah, I think God I gives you that. If you don't have it, it's tough. <laughs> what I try to tell people, like you know, with with time feel, like um, even blues players, there's a Sonny Rollins solo, the sax player on Tenor Madness, and there's not a lot of notes in it, but his time is so unreal. And I say, just learn it and mm -hmm. play it every day, and then if you match it. You know that means you're starting to hear where the time is put, and I, I and you know it, that really helped me get my time like more in the pocket. You need to practice, but I don't know that you could say to someone, "No, behind the beat," because what does that mean? Right, right. Like you, that's not a, it's not a, an equation. It's just kind of like. But like where I'm playing, that's kind of lazy, right? That's super lazy. <laughs> chords man that, that sound really cool so um I, I you know again I don't I think we got like 10 minutes 10 minutes or so um, there's a bunch of things um, and I want to uh, I'll go into the gear thing in a oh, second yeah. but I saw something on Facebook where you were doing some Steely Dan thing tell me about that oh um, the yeah. American Vinyl All-Star right, show right 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 oh that's what was that because I remember say, I heard a Steely Dan tune I thought you did right right so the, um, I I actually subbed for Skunk Baxter on that gig the, so. Skunk Baxter, you know, Skunk Baxter <laughs> is probably one of, I think he was the first guitar player for Steely Dan. And then the Doobies. Did he do really in, in the year? Yep. He, him and Dennis Budimer. Was it Dennis Budimer? I forget who the other guitar player oh, was. Oh, Danny, uh, Danny Diaz. Um. De maybe it was Danny Diaz, but uh, Skunk Baxter, is, uh, he was in uh, Doobie Brothers as well. And he, do you know he's also like an astrophysicist? He is. I've seen yeah. him on CNN. I saw him in, on Capitol Hill once. <laughs> I mean, he's got the mustache down like that. So he, he subbed. For Skunk Baxter. <laughs> yeah. The story's... How is that? <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. I get a call from a friend of mine, and she said, you know, um, my boyfriend's band that he manages, they need a guitarist, like, tonight, and it's in Connecticut. And I'm, like, near here. I'm at, like, upfront guitars, like, playing guitars, being goofing off. And I go, what is it? And she's like, well, Skunk can't make the gig. And then I'm like, who's Skunk? You know, she can't be talking about Skunk Baxter. So, so I go. Well, what, so what? What is it? Well, okay. So here's. A, we'll send you the song list. Here's the address. Come out tonight's just informal. You do some acoustic stuff like uh, Elvis tunes or whatever. That's fine. So I open the email. It's four Steely Dan tunes. It's four Boston tunes because Barry Goodrow's the other guitar player. Right. Right. And um, are you connected with Barry? Because I've tried to get him on the show and he hasn't replied to me. Um, I. I mean, I met and hung out with him for a few days. So. He'd be great on the show. How did you do that then? Was it written? I mean, you can't wing those. And, but no. If I remember watching on Facebook, you had some exact solos. I did. Like. How'd you do that? Well, um, what, what were the tunes? Uh, Ricky, don't lose that number. Reeling in the years. Um, uh, my old. I've never school. played it. I, I don't even know it. So it's a, how do you wing reeling in the years? I didn't wing anything. So I uh, I raced home. 
literally threw, I threw stuff in a cardboard box, like clothes. I grabbed just amps, you guitars. what Jude Gold said on his podcast. You have like, what, 100 guitars in that apartment somewhere? Oh, I, I, that's an exaggeration. I have 32. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting? But who's counting? <laughs> so I go out there, I check into my hotel, and I start playing, and they're doing a meet and greet because it's um, uh, the drummer that played with James Brown the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and then the keyboardist that played for the Whalers. So it was four Bob Marley tunes, it was four James Brown tunes, which I already knew, thankfully. So your question, pot of coffee, all-nighter. Hmm. And so, and then I'm talking to Barry that night, I'm like, well, there. So, like a gig of Friday night, and then you got down there on Thursday, and you were, had all that time? No, so it was a Friday, so I go up Friday, do the acoustic, uh, but I had to be ready for sound check at noon in rehearsal uh -huh. the next day. So, so you I, didn't sleep? I had, really? I had 15 hours to get down there and learn it. Right. So I didn't sleep, so, and it's not like I had all the next day, because it was rehearsal. So I go down, I like, I'm practicing, and I'm getting worried because like my fingers starting to hurt because all the bends, mm. and they're like, try to do the skunk parts as close as you can. Now, right. Yeah, so the only one I did. I hope you got paid a lot for this. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so I, I skipped my, my old school, I learned it, but I, I did my own solos. Like at the rehearsal. School, that's the, that's uh, a hard. Bang, 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 bang. Yeah, yeah, all those like. Those like. Skunkisms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would need longer than a few hours to, to get that under my fingers. Um, the Boston tunes, Barry was super cool. Do the low harmony. Was he a cool guy? Super. Yeah. Oh, he's a yeah. sweetheart. Um, I try not to geek him too much because I was a big fan. Right, right. Um, and yeah, I was older, but you you were right in that age group where you know that Boston, that album that album goes. Did you have a, have a rock man? Oh yeah, I did. I still have mine. It the, still works. This yes, still works. Oh, I'm gonna come hang with you. Yeah, I miss yeah. mine. Why did I get rid of it? Yeah, and it had it was. Stereo. We always get rid of stuff. Guitar players. My suggestion to the young guitar players: don't get rid of anything. <laughs> I traded in my Jaguar and four hundred dollars of paper root money for my Gibson Les Paul, which I bought in 1969. <laughs> you still have it? Yes, I still do. I still oh. Do. But I, I wish I had that Jaguar. I know. That's a great was guitar. Was it a Jaguar? Yeah, it was a Jaguar. And then I traded in my probably early 70s 335 for this, which is, this is 1980. This is the first production year of uh, um, Oh, the Paul really Smith, good stuff. The very first one. The you know, really good stuff. EU Worlitches. I don't know if you remember I used Worlitches. to teach at the one in Framingham. Oh, really? Framingham, yeah. Do you know Jay Tulio? Yeah, we well, know Jay. He's yeah. great. You yeah, know, Jay's a good buddy of mine. He's so, on the road. He's a so, star, man. Again, so that, that was, so how did it work out? Great. With that gig? The gig, um, it nailed it. Uh, and, um, you know, Skunk couldn't make it because uh, he had a medical thing that he had to stay in California for. Yeah, he's an older guy. He's probably 70s. Yeah, so they just said, you know, you just sub, you know, can you come sub? And I didn't, when I said yes, I thought it was like a cover band. I thought it was, and then I was like, these are pretty tough tunes for a cover band. And why just Boston and Steely Dan? And, and then by the time I got there, I found out, and you know, I met Barry, and then um, uh, it, was, it was a blast. How did you do the Boston uh, harmonies? I learned, I just learned them. I know, but you know, he was, it's so funny, because he, he hits one note, Barry hits one note, All right. you know it's him. Oh, really? It's just, it's it, that the sound. The guitar players like that. Great. Pat Metheny always said that. You know, Pat Metheny's famous for never changing his strings, I guess, supposedly. Really? But wow. he can pick up anything, I think. You know, Ro you know Robin Ford can, Larry Carlton can. I just played well. with Robin Ford last two so weeks So quickly, later. Gear, tell me about what you're working with these days and, you know. Well, most, uh, let's see, well, for guitars, um, for my, like, Leo Fender needs, it's always G&L. Right. Um, this one is, as you can see, is kind of like a, a Mustang, but yeah. with a P90. And a, it's beautiful. Yeah, I it's, love it's the color. a great one. And um, and I bought a bunch of them with upfront guitars near here at Bellingham, Mass. They have like upfront they're the guitars. Yeah, no, Bellingham. They I have. I don't know that. I'm probably on Facebook with them. They have. They're the best G and L dealer. And I actually walked in. This is the first one I bought from them. And I walked in. I said, I got to have this. So for like my Leo Fender needs, and then yep. I'm, I'm playing a really nice. Uh, Tyler guitar, James Tyler. Don't know James Tyler. Oh man, it's like what Mike Landau played for years and Wayne Krantz and and now me. It's just it's 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 kind of got a strat shaped body, but the sick finish. I should have brought it because mm -hmm. and then um, he makes his own pickups too. It's it's a very you know I would never by no means say it's like a, a Fender at all. It's its own thing, but it's got a, a, the the neck is gorgeous. The the fretboard's beautiful. So that 
Um, I'm using Little Walter tube amps exclusively now. Is that a Boston company? No, he's in North Carolina. Right, and one I, man I, show. I'm following you on Facebook, and I've been seeing the events you've been going to and doing that. Yeah, and they're the, they're basically tweed amps in a head. Like he's building right. them like Leo built them in the late '40s. Uh huh. So no turret board or anything. Cool. And other than that, he won't tell me a secret. So one of them cool. is a tweed amp. Um, that won't break up, so you yeah. got that clean tone. And the other one I have is a 22. Is just you crank it. And Who's that amp? Dumble? Is that the guy who you know who won't tell any? He's got the hundred thousand dollar amps that Robin Ford uses. No, but Robin Ford left them. I heard he left to go to Little Walter, and that's why I, I just played with him. Right, right. So we just did hundred thousand dollars for a Dumble amp. But that's Robin Ford. Right, right. But like I heard Robin through the Little Walter 59, it, and he just had a Les Paul. That was it was. And um, quickly, uh, the pedals and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And what are you doing? What are you? Um, who, who's um, supporting you on the t pedal world? And well, Jam Pedals is my main one. I don't have any with me just because okay. I brought. This is my little yep. travel board. Right. But Jam Pedals, I, I have. Um, they're a company out of Greece and all analog. I think they have some of the new old stock chips from back in the day. Uh huh. Like you know, they can never make a chorus like the CE1, but right. but this guy can. I suspect he cool. has, but he won't. He won't tell either. But um, that's the best delays I've ever tried. I have a, a rotary from him. Um, uh, a really cool delay that has like a kind of a Qtron if you want on the on the delay or you know like the modulation. Cool. So jam pedals big time exotic, which I have this BB plus here. This is my small travel board that fits on my gig bag. Yeah, I need a small board like that. You know, I have a big one of these huge ones. Now let me as we wrap up. How can people get in touch with you? How can they follow you? And and, and first of all, before you do that. What's coming in the future? What are the goals, aspirations? Do you have an album coming out or anything like that? And plus, how can they get a hold of you? Um, yeah, so um, for the last year or so, I've been working on an experimental album. And there's one video up. Um, I, I'm taking singers um, from different countries, with right. different native languages. And I'm just, we're taking either one of their songs or a song that exists and only keeping the melody. And um, I do, do kind of a sonic thing with it. So I've got a couple of those done. I need to do one in French. I need to do one. Um, I think I want to do one in Japanese. So, but there's one on YouTube. If you look up, it's called it's, it's called Nada. Scott Turley, N A D A, Nada. Cool. So that's an experimental one, and I'm starting to write for a new album now. Cool. So, because I've been cool. working a lot of stuff, and then change in touch with me. Yeah. Um, you can. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Scott Turley. Um, Facebook, I have a Scott Turley Music, um, and then ScottTurley.com. So you can you can. Find me. It's pretty easy to find me. I don't hide. Cool. <laughs> so we'll jam out on some. Um, you'll follow mm -hmm. it. It's A minor to D seven, and then it does. It's like an A minor type thing. You got so it. You go, like. Thank you.
Job, man. Thank you, man. Thank you for having fun. me.